Thank you, Bridget. I asked to be the last because I knew that my colleagues were far more competent than I am on, on the structural economic condition. And certainly, if you know my training, I'll look a bit more to the political dimension. But I have only two points. I have decided to call the first Hertinger versus Di Maio, but now I have a better term, the perfect store. <laughs> and the second, it is the Mattarella gamble in this business. So let me, just two points, very simple. Well, let me, the first point. We are so often deeply involved in the day-to-day -day crisis of the EU that we tend to forget the bigger picture. The bigger picture is a gloomy picture. Now, we could go back to the early 70s to, to see sign of disaffection with the EU. But let's forget the very, very early Danish symptoms. But at least since the constitutionally non-required referendum on the Maastricht Treaty in France, we have gone through a continuous series of problematic results. At every European election, at every referendum, the victories for Europe, let's call this, have always been marginal. Every time there was a sort of sense, you know, even this time we managed. Uh, we have gone through the Greece crisis, the Austrian crisis, not to speak of Brexit, but also France, saved by his own strong institutional system from Madame Le Pen, after all. So it's a 25 year, 92 to today, of problematic political support for the EU. Now that's a, a quarter of a century and is more or less a bit less than half of the history of the EU. Now, that's big. Now, now we have dealing with Italy, of course, and now Italy is, as, as it has been shown, perhaps a far bigger problem than others, but nevertheless, this is a story of 20 years. And what have been able to produce throughout this story? A simple concept, populists. My students know that I don't like the concept at all. Mm. But <laughs> let's, there are these populists that do not understand, that do not align. And, and the perfect storm comes in a sense when you have this famous uh, Hertinger Declaration, which I want to con completely decontextualize. Let's imagine it was not a German address to Italian voters, but an Estonian address in the French one. Though this is less likely, I suppose. But uh, uh, let's imagine. It's not a question of the man. Here you have a man who's... I mean, he has a degree in law and economics from the University of Tübingen, if I'm not, correct me if I'm ever. He was a distinguished lawyer. He entered the youth organization of CDU already in the early 80s. He had a long experience. He was chairing the CDU parliamentary group for 15 years or something like that. He was prime minister from uh, um, prime minister of Baden-Württemberg, a solid experience with an impeccable CV, national politician, that then moved to the EU and for about 10 years or 12 years is commissioner in various, in various. There you have Mr. Di Maio. Mr. Di Maio is a, a, 20, a 32 year old Napolitanian who never got any university degree. He tried a couple of universities but without success though he managed to be student representative in both early on. Well, at the age of 21, in 2007, entered as an early supporter of the Five Star of the Grillo Movement, never did any kind of work. In his CV, it is reported that he was a steward at the football stadium of Naples in Sao Paulo, and that was his main commitment. That at the age of 27, in 2013 became member of parliament and is now one of the two leading figures. But represent 32% of a 60 million population country. That's the perfect story. That's a perfect story. And when I hear about trust, of course, to, to bring trust between these two kind of vision. Now, Mr. Ertinger says something very interesting. Again, let's call him Mr. X because, because I think he what is said represents what they think, most of the people working 
in Brussels. He said that the election could teach. That's a very interesting as, uh, expression. It didn't say what would have been totally right. Poor economic measure might bring country to disruption or to enormous cost. Be careful not to make wrong choices. He said, market teaches. Now, that's different because it is a bit surprising. As a German, you could say that, well, I mean, I'm not so sure that in the early 30s the market taught a good lesson to the Germans. We are not sure that, just to jump in from um, um, the many cases, we are not so sure that Venezuela, which seems to have, what I've heard, 18,000% inflation, well, has reconfirmed <laughs> the president of the, has learned a lesson from the market. And we could go on. I'm not so sure that the Greeks have learned a lesson from the market. They've been destroyed. I mean, so the market can destroy a country. The idea that the market can teach, it's a very strange idea in my sense. I mean, the lesson can be clear and the student can learn it. That's it. What sort of vision is this? What sort of uh, image of the voters these people have? presumably rational kind of people that go back home and compute whether this is going to cost them more or less if they do this and that. There is a complete misunderstanding of what, in my view, politics is about in most of the national countries. Irrational, emotional issues. And, and, and. So it is the perfect storm. And, and to reveal... Uh, uh, that's my, my first point. I mean, I just it's not a very clever point, but this gulf which has created between the public opinion and the Brussels administration could not be made clear, more obviously, by these two guys. I mean, going beyond their personal story, but just to opposite. I mean, it is the perfect storm, as you, uh, as you said. Now, uh, second, second point, the current crisis, the gamble. I mean, I take again the lead from your way of understanding what Mr. Mattarella did. Now, now, now we get to the second important aspect of politics, I mean, contingency. Choices on the short term and what the result is. Now, we have got a very good result. We have got a government, which is not always <laughs> certain in Italy. We have got a government who has a majority in both chambers, which is crucial in Italy, as you know, and that's not always the case. And we have also have got a government in which you have the people who have won the elections which is somehow normatively good. We are worried about what this government could be doing. That's clear. But how this happened, what was the alternative? Now, let's look a moment, for a moment to the week, which is crucial, between the 25th of May and the 2nd of June. It's a week in which I spend two sleepless nights. It doesn't happen to me very often. But in, those, in that week, I spent two sleepless nights. I'll show you why. The choice of Mr. Mattarella are for whom I have the highest respect as, a, as the president of the Italian Republic, but whose opinion and choices have to be judged. Were well, not to me, it was lucky, but they were not to me very clear and very consistent. Now, after the election, he, he, he had a choice. He could give the mandate to Mr. Salvini, which seems to represent a coalition, a loose coalition, of 37% of the votes, but he could also give it to Mr. Di Maio, who represented a solid 32% for a single party. That was the choice. He decided not to make that choice. And he decided to go for a long consultation in which he gave an exploratory mandate, first to Madame Alberti Casellati, whom I happened to know in that occasion. Uh, I didn't know. She had been... Formerly, she was the chair of the Senate, which in our constitution says is the second, uh, uh, the second position in the Italian state. Then he gave the mandate to Mr. Figo, who was the chair of the uh, chamber, which is the third position. You know, it was very constitutionally respectful of certain traditions, no, not in no way compulsory, but he decided not to appoint any significant leaders, neither of the Five Star nor of the, of the Lega, and not a any other third leader, I mean, you know, there are countries in Europe, like Belgium, the Netherlands, who have this figure of the formateur, you know, the kind of man or woman who is uh, recognized, that goes around. But that, first, is not a tradition in Italy. We never had really strong formateur. 
And second, that clearly was not a choice of Mattarella, because otherwise you don't go for the second position in the state. You go for some key figure that you think might help. He didn't do that. He might have been very clever. One interpretation. He left a lot of time for these two parties to elaborate their own contract, how they, they, they call them. Perhaps. Then, the two parties, without having yet appointed a prime minister, produce a contract, a program, let's call it this contract. The Germans have used this term, and then the Italians immediately say, oh, we also do the contract. If the Germans do it, uh, uh, Now, they produced this contract, and then they appointed Conte, Conte, the prime minister, and Conte produced a set of ministers, which includes the name of Mr. Savona. And you all know the story. So Mattarella, the president of the Republic, was confronted with a list of ministers with the man Savona, which was highly controversial from his point of view. We might come back on Savona later on in the debate, but it's an interesting Certainly, it is out of that Italian tradition, which I summarize in three names, that brought Italy into the Euro. Prodi, Amato, Monti. That sort of stuff. Which unconditionally brought Italy into the Euro. Huh? It's a different tradition, clear. Now, now is Mattarella sitting in his, in his room, I think is uh, the 27th of May, and he has two options. The first is to yell, to say, okay, I will accept Savona. Presumably, he believes that this is going to have a market crisis escalating. And it is obviously worried about that. Your interpretation that the adhesion to the euro is some sort of a constitutional matter, not really. I mean, we entered the euro with a single parliamentary vote and there was no higher level kind of commitments except a parliamentary vote. But perhaps you could say that by now, the Europe is part of the material constitution of Italy, and you could reason in those terms. The second alternative was to veto. What would have happened? At that stage, the 27th of May, I think he didn't know. There could be a new government. In fact, he decided the same time in which he vetoed Savona and the list of ministers produced by Conte, he appointed new cabinet. Again, that's a very crucial choice. He could have left Gentiloni in charge. Why he did appoint a new cabinet? With whom? Mr. Cottarelli, the quintessential technocratic from IMF. Again, very clever move. Was he saying, okay, if you don't make a cabinet not without Savona, then I would appoint the most far away, the most unacceptable for you. But he must have known that not a single MP, perhaps Monti, who is a senator of Vita, might have voted for Cotarelli, but not a single MP would have voted this cabinet, which would have fallen down two minutes after he had entered the chamber. And then what? Well, then you could have two options because at this time the ball is in the field of the two parties. They could yell and say, okay, Mr. President, Savona is perhaps a too controversial name. We, could, we put somebody else in the Ministry of Economy and we move Savona. You know, this is the end result. But they could have said in this chicken game, because that's what it was, they could have said, okay, fine. We want new election because there is no cabinet. There was debate about the time, 9th of July, 20th of July, end of August, beginning of September. But anyway, eight to 12 months of campaign with a single topic on the agenda. Mr. Oettinger, Mr. Draghi, which everybody knew, was not a close friend of Mr. Savona. The commission, the strong powers, the press of the Republic preventing the Italians to have the cabinet that they voted at the election. That would have been eight weeks of campaign on this topic. The Lega jumped from 18 to 25 in one week in those days. And there was even a survey that said 28. 
So what was the risk? The risk was that he rejected Savona, the leg and five star would go for new election, would ask new election. Cottarelli could not stay without a single vote in parliament for long. There would have been new election either in late July or early September. And the outcome would be the following. In Italy, one third of the seats are majority seats. They would have been taken, all of them, by either Five Star or Lega. Certainly Five Star in the South and Lega in the North. One third of the parliament. Plus, these two parties would have made between 53 and 57 percent of the proportional votes. Now, with an easy calculation, you could say that they could have reached about 67, 6, 6, 6, 8 percent of the votes in Parliament. And this is not an irrelevant figure. This, according to the Italian Constitution, is a constitutional majority. The first constitutional majority that would have been produced in this country since 1945. With two-thirds of the votes in Parliament, you can't modify the Constitution at your will with no further check. No referendum. No. What could do the President of the Republic if this outcome were to materialize? Absolutely nothing. These two parties would have controlled the two chamber, would have had the chairmanship of the Senate, the chairmanship of the House, and a constitutional majority. I'm cutting very short. That's a Polish-Hungarian Panorama. We know what Mattarella did. Mattarella vetoed, so took the risk. Took the risk. Was he well advised? He thought that they would never make an, a coalition, uh, an electoral coalition for the next election. It was a gamble, it was a bet. You know, the bet was successful. The 29.30, the two nights in which I spent uh, sleepless in my bed, watching at the TV whether there was any news. <laughs> of course, these two parties negotiated intensively, and they came to the conclusion that they would withdraw. Move Savona out of the Ministry of the Economy, no, an agreement. And then Conte came back again. Cottarelli, of course, was, was uh, mm, put aside, I mean, he knew his role was, I don't know what his role was, but honestly, but, and, and, and we happily ended up. So basically, that's why the, this small story of events relate to the euro. Mattarella was confronted with two options. Turmoil in the market, Savona, the risk of a constitutional revision majority, potential new election. He went for the risk of a constitutional majority. Can we read this as the power of the Eurozone over national politics? Because honestly, me, and of course I count for nothing, I would have never done so. I would have never risked a constitutional reform in majority for a fear of Mr. Savona, uh, you know, role in Europe. Even if I thought that perhaps Mr. Savona represented a sort of credible threat of plan B, to put it shortly. Even in that case, I would have never risked the paramount good of politics, a constitutional majority. And it did, and it was successful. So now everybody writes on the newspaper that he was a genius. I think it was, there was a considerable component of luck <laughs> in it. And I, I, I am very happy that this was the end result, but nevertheless, in this crucial situation, the fear of the markets prevail over everything else. Uh, and the fear of Europe, in a sense, prevail over everything else, even of such an important public good as the, as the fact. And these were not only a constitutional majority that we never had in the history of Italy, but the constitutional majority of two parties who had never been in government before. So, the highest risk you could run. So we are very happy about what we have. I know there are lots of problems still, but mind you, we have avoided perhaps another problem that might, might be behind the door. Thank you very much.